and welcome. From the beginning, the Doom Patrol established itself as a group of outsider misfits that never quite fit in the DC universe. And for nearly 60 years, the team has remained on the fringes of the DC mainstream. There have been many variations of the team over the years, but the original series from the 1960s is the basic foundation for all that followed. Originally, the team consisted of Larry Trainer, also known as Negative Man, Rita Farr, also known as Elasta Woman, Cliff Steele, also known as Automaton, and Niles Calder, also known as The Chief. Very early on, Cliff would be renamed Robot Man, and Rita would be renamed Elastigirl. Cliff's name change was due to the writer disliking the sound of Automaton. Rita's name change was, presumably, to make her more identifiable to a younger audience. Probably the best way to describe the original 41-issue series is to call it a bizarre, ongoing melodrama, especially the latter half of the series. For the most part, each issue is self-contained, but there are a lot of recurring elements, motifs, and characters that continue throughout the series. Notoriously, the characters regularly disagreed with one another and got into petty arguments over nothing. Cliff was a textbook example of clinical depression due to being nothing more than a brain inside an unfeeling robot shell. The amount of times he engaged in self-mutilation was a bit concerning. Larry disliked the negative man power he acquired because it was a mindless entity he could barely control. Worse yet, this mindless being received all the praise Larry felt he deserved. Larry was also radioactive, and he had to remain covered in specially treated bandages to prevent irradiating everyone around him. Rita felt like a beautiful loser who was not like other girls. Gaining her powers meant losing the glamorous, movie star lifestyle she had grown accustomed to enjoying. She wasn't a dilettante, but she did miss a normal lifestyle. The chief was straight up arrogant and manipulative. He also had a secret past that he only shared when absolutely necessary. Overall, they were neurotic, but functional as a team. In my opinion, they were an unconventional support group that regularly beat up similar weirdos in an effort to deal with their own personal issues. I mean, one could spend a reasonable amount of time simply analyzing the complex psychopathology and motivations of each character. Along with these main characters was a rotating cast of supporting characters that were equally neurotic. There was Steve Dayton, the fifth wealthiest man in the world, who went by the name of Mento. His attraction to Rita was more than a little creepy and stalkerish. There was the green teen, Beast Boy, who would show up and be an annoying hanger-on. He was basically a groupie that demanded to be part of the band. The bad guys also frequently recurred. General Immortus, the Brotherhood of Evil, and the alien Garguax all made multiple appearances. They also teamed up and had their own ongoing evolving dramas. Madame Rouge, a member of the Brotherhood of Evil, deserves a special mention. This character dramatically evolves during the latter half of the series. She goes from being a standard oddball lackey to being a tragic manipulated figure that eventually destroys both her teammates and the Doom Patrol. To break the series down, it has three rough but somewhat distinct parts. Roughly speaking, the first third of the series is untethered weirdness that establishes a tone and a set of recurring characters. The middle part of the series becomes melodramatic, where interpersonal relationships become complex and convoluted. The final year or so of the series all leads to the dramatic conclusion. The most memorable part of this original Doom Patrol saga, and this is what makes it an actual saga rather than a series of related stories, is the fact that the series came to a definitive end. As previously mentioned, there are some elements and motifs that recur throughout the series. The melodramatic petty infighting is one such element. Also, the members of the Doom Patrol almost always call each other by their actual names, not the superhero names given to them. In fact, these superhero names weren't ones they chose themselves. It was the media that gave the team and the members of the team their names. To the members of the Doom Patrol, these superhero names reflect how society perceives them. These are their freak names. For the most part, Doom Patrol and the villains they face have origins and powers that are scientifically based. It's bad rudimentary science, but science nonetheless. Both this and the infighting are the most obvious elements that were probably inspired by what was going on in Marvel Comics at the time, specifically the Fantastic Four. Despite being credited as being based in Midway City, all the Doom Patrol adventures take place in indistinct locations. This gives the series a feeling that it's slightly disconnected from the mainstream DC universe. Not only that, but it doesn't ground the team anywhere specific, 
That is, for all anyone knows, their adventures could be happening in whatever city the reader lives. This disconnect is further enhanced by the fact that the Doom Patrol only had two crossovers during its run, one with the Challengers of the Unknown, and the other with the Flash in Brave and the Bold. Originally, the team that would become the Doom Patrol was announced as the Legion of the Strange. This announcement took place in the letter page of My Greatest Adventure number 79, the issue that preceded the team's first appearance. This was likely an editorial placeholder name for a team that had yet to be created. The comic book series, My Greatest Adventure, was on the verge of cancellation. With the rise in popularity of superheroes in the early 60s, it was decided to repurpose that failing adventure title into a superhero feature. The editor of that title, Murray Boltonoff, asked the writer, Arnold Drake, to come up with the bizarre superhero team to star in the comic. After submitting a brief outline, Drake was then given four days to turn in a full script. Drake turned to fellow writer, Bob Haney, to help plot and script the first Doom Patrol adventure. According to both writers, each wrote about half of the script. Haney also co-created Negative Man, with Drake creating the other members of the team. Following the first two issues, Drake would be the sole writer of the Doom Patrol series, although Haney claims he actually co-wrote the first three or four issues. This is difficult to confirm, since he was uncredited for that work, if he actually provided it. At the time, Arnold Drake was an established comic book writer. He was also very aware of Marvel Comics' popularity with an older teen audience. In part, Doom Patrol was an attempt to replicate the appeal of a Marvel comic and to attract readers who didn't ordinarily try a DC comic. The artwork for the series was primarily provided by Bruno Premiani, an Italian artist with a very distinct, clean style. While Premiani had a few credits to his name, most notably the Western comic Tomahawk, he was almost entirely unknown in the industry prior to drawing Doom Patrol. In fact, following the end of Doom Patrol, Premiani would only draw one more comic story before completely disappearing from mainstream comics. Arnold Drake characterized Premiani's style the best. He drew with an Italian accent. While American artists generally exaggerated the drama of a scene, Premiani emphasized the realistic aspects, and he resisted the overly dynamic Jack Kirby-style angles that were becoming standard for the superhero genre. This approach grounded the weirdness of the scenes and the characters he was asked to draw. Certainly, this was a somewhat traditional approach favored at DC, but Premiani's artwork looks and feels distinct. Again, he was taking highly fantastical concepts and making them look real. That is a skill that cannot be overstated. The team was successful enough that My Greatest Adventure was retitled Doom Patrol with the 86th issue. Its success only lasted a few short years. During the late 60s, DC was seeing their market share dissolve to the increased output of Marvel Comics. As a consequence, DC's overall sales began to wane, especially on superhero titles. With cancellation a certainty, Arnold Drake proposed a unique idea. He proposed killing off the team in the final issue. In an interview with Amazing Heroes magazine in 1981, Arnold Drake claimed this was a dual strategy. If there was enough support, the comic would have been saved. Obviously, that was the intended result. However, should that tactic not succeed, there was a lesson to be learned from Doom Patrol's fate. That lesson being, superheroes can die. The issue was scripted as proposed, and, in the final issue, the team died. They were blown to pieces. It wasn't even slightly ambiguous. Although, yeah, the creative team directly asking the reader to write in and change the team's fate did slightly diminish the impact. Still, the Doom Patrol was, unequivocally, dead. This approach to the final issue led to a unique distinction for the team. It was the first comic book that ended with the death of the main characters. Overall, it gave the series a sense of finality that didn't usually exist in mainstream superhero comics. But that's not all that's strange and unique about that issue. The editor and the artist both appear in the comic and directly appeal to the reader to save the team. Naturally, one should ask, why didn't the artist and the writer appear? Why was it the artist and the editor? That seems like an odd combination. Well, by the time Arnold Drake handed in the final Doom Patrol script, he had managed to find work at Marvel. Ironically, he began scripting The Uncanny X-Men, which was the Marvel comic that some, including Drake himself, claimed was inspired by the Doom Patrol. Drake accepting work from Marvel, on Uncanny X-Men no less, did not sit well with DC management. In turn, they ordered the script and the artwork, which had already been drawn, to be changed so the editor, Murray Boltonoff, was in place of Drake. In a way, this was punishment for Drake not being loyal to DC. Despite this plea to the readers, the title was cancelled, and Doom Patrol went to comic book heaven.
In 1977, Cliff Steele would be revived and go on to join a newly formed Doom Patrol, which is a topic for another day. In 1981, within the pages of New Teen Titans, Cliff would search for the killers of Doom Patrol, Madame Rouge, and General Zal. With the help of the New Teen Titans, these killers would meet their ultimate fate. Thus, these three issues provide a coda to the previously established Doom Patrol saga. This arc gives closure to the story, and it also works as a memorial for an obscure team that didn't deserve the fate they received. It also confirms that Rita Farr, Niles Calder, and Larry Trainer did not escape death. They were gone but not forgotten. Now, the 1985 series, Crisis on Infinite Earths, gives some validity to these deaths. During that series, nearly every character DC owned appeared at some point. Cliff Steele appears, since he and a new version of the Doom Patrol were resurrected in 1977. But Rita Farr, Larry Trainer, and The Chief do not appear. Larry Trainer is listed as appearing in one issue, but I could not locate him whatsoever. I do believe Metamorpho is improperly credited as Larry, since they both have somewhat similar facial appearances. I could be wrong, but as far as I can tell, I am not. The point being, until the continuity reset button was pressed in 1985, the original Doom Patrol, with the exception of Cliff, was actually dead. While mostly forgotten at the time, their deaths were honored, so to speak. While there may be others, the only other character I can think of that shares this distinction is the Earth 2 Batman who died in Adventure Comics number 462 from 1979. In the end, the original Doom Patrol was a charming, quirky series that ended on a very bittersweet but appropriate note. At the time, it was one of DC's more successful experimental titles, most of which lasted less than a few years. While its impact was marginal at best, its uniqueness would inspire others to revive it time and time again. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.